So, I don't well, know. No, no, I'm, 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 uh, uh, if you look at people like Colin Benders, who now started their own cryptocurrency as well on Rally, really? that's, that's a whole different thing altogether, of course. Colin Benders has started his own currency. Yeah, and the the wall and the the abbreviation is of course VCA. Wow, <laughs> that, is just, that is the most futuristic thing I've ever heard. <laughs> How was your well, day? Well, I started my own currency. How was your day? Yeah. Well, all right, mate. I, uh... Talking about nefarious of case. <laughs> no, but that was just uh, I was I was surprised to see that, and it's it's um, well. Of course, you do see, well, now that El Salvador, of all places, have embraced Bitcoin as their go-to currency next to the U.S. dollar. Hmm. I'm curious to see what's going to happen there. <laughs> well, I don't know. But do you remember being in Cambodia and paying it in dollars? I remember thinking yeah. that was weird. I was like, I'm in Cambodia, but I'm paying with U.S. dollars. Like, wow. Oh, yeah. Well... For a lot of places, the, either the US dollar or nowadays, especially in Africa, where the euro is, has become quite a, well, a staple currency, it's, uh, mm. it's interesting to see, of course. Yeah. Bonkers. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I just saw uh, Split Radax say, well, the Colin Bender's currency should have been called Bendcoin. I just Bend. had to laugh at yeah. that. <laughs> That's so many so bends. We're, yeah, of course, of course. Well, it's it's it's... Will it blend or will it bend? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, Alex, uh, Milo Melodies, thanks so much for joining. We're already three minutes uh, past the hour. Uh, we still see people uh, trickling in. Um, before anyone has anything to say, I do have to put up a big disclaimer here, is that we are recording this, uh, this episode and it will not be made publicly available. Uh, both Myla Melodies and myself will be sharing this with our patrons on Patreon. Um, just so you know, big disclaimer, be aware of that. And um, yeah, it won't be shared with a great, with a big community, but just the patrons. Um, other than that, well, let me just uh, kick this off. Um, first of all, well, everyone, welcome to the, the Modular Clubhouse, um, where we have hopefully we weekly meetings with people in the Eurorack sphere, whether it's Eurorack makers, Eurorack influencers, or really, really important people like Mr. Mylan Melodies himself, Alex. Um, well, first of all, thanks so much for uh, for taking the time to, uh, well, to speak to all of us here um, on Discord. And yeah, it's uh, it's an honour. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Um, the yeah, honour is mine. That's sort of, yeah, it's nice. Well, it was you who started to uh, to hackle uh, Jeremy Rapson's <laughs> recording when he was uh, on this show. What was it like a couple of weeks back? Yeah. So I thought, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on this and see if we can uh, get you on here as well. So uh, yeah, that's great. Well, Jeremy's not here, so uh, I got away scot free. No, um, I, I I I do have to. Uh, <laughs> I, I do have to well say that I tried reaching out to him and say, well, okay, we've got we've got we've got Mylar Melodies on today. If you want to hackle him, you're free to join. And he, he's got some other things he had to take care of, unfortunately. Otherwise yeah, we would have yeah, we would have yeah, had yeah. a repeat. <laughs> I am busy, I'm washing my hair. Fair, fair, whatever. You find out who your real friends are, don't you? Yeah, apparently, yeah, that's that's the thing, of course. Well, he um he had to do some some classes or something. I'm not sure what, but uh, let's see what we uh what we're going into. I still see people joining. That's of course a great thing. Um, for everyone who's uh, who's keeping on joining, uh, again, welcome to the uh, the modular clubhouse. And um, yeah, we're here with uh, the one, the only, the the man, the legend, the annoying, the annoying the, the, voice. The, 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 <laughs> The, Sorry, the annoying voice on the, the like, internet. Oh, don't you worry. Yeah. Um, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with uh, with with just uh, someone talking about a bit of a British tang. That's no problem at all. I did once. I met someone who um, who happened to be blind. Who I was talking to at a, a, a like a trade event. Uh, mm -hmm. Trey, who's someone that some folks based, based around Bristol may know, he's an absolutely awesome guy. I remember I'd never met him before and we, we were chatting and, and he's like, we've been talking for a little while and he went, mate, he's like, do you, is, is Mylon Melodies in here? Do you know where he is? And I was like, 
uh, well, I'm my loud melodies. And he's like, oh my God. And he went, you don't sound anything like him. <laughs> like, <laughs> in the flesh. I was like, yeah, I suppose when I make videos, there's about 40 compressors and <laughs> like a whole chain of EQ, Neve, virtual Neve preamps between me and, you know, when you hear my voice in real life, when not through equipment, I'm like, hello. How, are you how many how many effects are you running currently then? Well, you see, I you know I have to have some. So I actually I'm going through the road Roadcaster, um, which is basically what is it actually doing? It's putting uh, compressor, well, high pass yes, filter, noise gate, de mm. Yeah, but I've I've turned off the Aural Exciter in the big bottom. Uh, the only big bottom is mine. the things I was looking into <laughs> when I when I first started doing this. I thought well, I need to get one of those because of the um the the ds and the the big button mm, and it is good now I'm, yeah it's 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 a great it's a great thing but i still need to well make sure that it, i can i can well, just sell it. the cost of it yeah, yeah, yeah to yeah. the ministry of finances that's very fair <laughs> no perfect perfect so well what i what i typically do and i'll, I'll, I'll explain this because we've got a lot of new people on the um on the show today in the audience so I started doing, well, my first synthesizer I bought in January of this year. I then said to myself, okay, well, that's great. That's, an, that's, an, that's a synthesizer. That's great. But you don't need to go full on in. So now we're eight months later and I've got the Discord going. I've got the YouTube channel going. So I didn't keep true to my promises. But I still have a couple of golden rules, and I want to indeed uh, interview uh, people, well, important people, influential people, uh, people in the know within the Eurorack or modular or synth space. And I try to uh, create several videos a month, hopefully more than one per week. And well, for now, I have the honor of uh, asking you some questions. and. After a while, we'll we'll turn it over to Q and A, so everyone in the audience can can ask some questions, and later on we'll turn it into a free for all, and we'll see what's uh, what's going to happen. Um, but first of all, how are you? Is everything okay? Is everything going going well? How are you feeling? Uh, I'm all right. My ear hurts. Um, I had like a sort of it's like a weird thing, like I know. Yeah, basically in the last couple of months I noticed I got like sort of pain in my ear and I had like a, a sort of weird mm -hmm. onset of like white noise. This is my right ear. And basically I it just my hearing just started to fade um, yeah. in one ear, um which was annoying. Uh and so mm -hmm. I basically went and eventually, you know, being sort of from Yorkshire, I'm a bit like you sort of do you think you're fine? And you're like, I don't need to go and get this sorted out. It's, it's not a problem. And then basically I did go to the doctors and been on sort of like funny spray for my nose um, in order to try and like open up and kind of clear out. But I have had like a couple of months or a month and a bit where I've really not had stereo. I've had just left channel audio, which has been a bit a, noise, a weird yeah. experience um, basically to lose stereo when I'm really – I came to realise that I was – like things like the Polybrute made me realize how much I valued stereo in synthesizers, like synths that have like auto panning where you can like pan the voice left and right. That's it's literally the best. Like it's absolutely the best feature. And I've, I was like playing with the uh, op six and I was like, where's the auto pan? You know, why isn't there an auto pan? Why doesn't every synth have this auto pan? Anyway, which is a very long winded way of saying like, I was suddenly very gutted. I was like, ah, oh. I don't know. You you think like stereo is a sort of, it, I think Kraftwerk described stereo as a luxury because they talked about live live shows. So like, you know, stereo is a privilege because people are, only people who are in the dead center of this sort of uh, the you know the the venue get the full benefit of it. Uh, and so I had to sort of wrestle with this idea that I might lose stereo, um, but I my hearing is actually improving. And although I've had ear pain today, like I can actually hear, I, I'm starting to be able to hear again in my right ear, which is good. So mm -hmm. um, health wise, um, okay. Although, yeah, look after your bloody ears. Like oh, I do have, I do have like some noise induced like hearing loss, but that's like four to eight K. I'm now like whenever I EQ things in the kind of four to eight K region, I just tend to like leave well alone. 
Like, I'm definitely, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? You, you always think you're going to, I can't hear it. So I'm probably going to break it. Do you know what I mean? And it, especially when you're EQing things like the podcast, you're like, have I just made this really ear splitting for everyone except me? These are questions <laughs> that keep me up at night. But are you are you are you reaching out to others to um uh to 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 verify that when you're mixing something? That is a good idea. I've thought about doing that. I didn't want to sort of impose it on other people, but yeah, I have thought about that. Like you could get someone to like just just send them a little like clip and just get them to check. So that is an option. Um, but currently, I don't know. I'm just sort of. Uh, I'm watching the meters carefully, A, being things, and doing a few test mixes. And I'm like, all right, it's fine. I've had no major complaints so far. Okay, as long as they're not, hopefully it's not things like tinnitus, of course, because that's, mm. of course, the, the thing you're dreading, I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah, of course. Oh, wow. Well, I, I do hope that that's not going to, going to, well, I'm going to continue, of course. It's just going to, that you're going to wake up tomorrow with all of those uh, problems gone, of course. Or what the doctor says, well, you take this pill and it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be great, of course. So from from a um from a perspective within the the the, the journey that um I, I like to um describe here, could you could you tell us a bit more about how you came into contact with music from a from a, from an early start and how that still influences the things you do currently? Yeah, like not from a particularly musical well, sort of am and I'm not. Like my, my parents aren't really into music tremendously, which is, I think if I said, they heard me say that, they'd be like really horrified. Of course we like music. I mean, in fairness, my dad like would sing, he would sort of go and like sing in local choirs and, you know, there was a musical society and there was a sort of concert at the end of the year and he, he was involved with those things, but he never put records on. It's not like he ever was like, son, come and listen to this Bach record. Um, he never did that, uh, although he did sometimes put the Bach record on, but um, but not much. It was never like a particularly musical household, but um, my sort of influences were definitely my brothers. I have like three brothers older than me. I'm the youngest one, and they definitely influenced me and like, Older brothers, for those of you who have them and will rem- you know will know, it's kind of yeah they can they are tastemakers. So my older brothers were playing playing lots of different stuff to see what I would be interested in, but it was kind of Orbital, um, which was the kind of breakaway, you know, band Orbital. Basically, when my brother played me that, I was like, wait a minute, like this, what's this? And um, and that was definitely the music that I first got into. Um, well, I did also. I was listening. To, I did listen to like Beastie Boys. My my other brother was a, uh, and sort of is still a DJ, kind of a dabbling DJ, but who's, you know, we're quite similar in many ways. Um, in the sense that we're a bit mad. We just buy things and really enjoy obsessing about equipment. Um, and he bought like. Uh, he bought an MC-303 and an MPC-2000 to go with his decks um, because he wanted to try his hand at production. And basically that MC-303, was it was literally the first bit of music equipment that I ever tried. So there was kind of that thing floating around and that was the catalyst um, for kind of getting into electronic or actually seeing if I could make electronic music because I had access to these little a few little boxes and I had the music being played to me that was, you know, I was being played electronic music and it was, it's that mystery of like, how on earth is Orbital made? How are they doing this? You know, I saw them play in Sheffield in 1999, which was actually the first gig I went to. And um, it was just like that sense of like, how are they doing this? Like what, what university did they go to that teaches you how to wear like lamps on your face and operate like banks of sort of strange machinery? What? How on earth do you learn how to do this? And of course, at the time, and there was the just like the burgeoning internet. Although I don't know if we had the internet at that exact time. Um, you had to kind of just well, re- it could yeah. Be, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, we didn't have it immediately. Was the thing, and so uh, and it was dial up. Uh, so yeah but course, um, yeah. but yeah I just I was reading future music magazines that my brother had had and I kind of started to piece it together and sort of 
it's really weird. Like the like many, many, many years later, I would end up writing, doing some reviews for Future Music magazine about modular stuff, like some of the first modular coverage that they had. And there was a part of me that was just like, when you were 15, this was the magazine that you learned from and now you're writing for it. Like, how cool is that? Like, that is bonkers. Um, like the boyhood dream come true, right? Yeah, yeah, just like, you just feel that sense of like, wow, how has this happened? Uh, but the answer is it took a long time. <laughs> it took a long bloody time of just a working. Of hard work, of yeah. Course, uh, yeah. Teaching yourself how to use this stuff, making lots of mistakes. Um buying lots of early noughties music equipment things like the sh32 if anyone remembers that one that's a weird one where on earth has that gone um and like yeah very odd the sa uh, su700 as well was a piece of equipment that i owned which is just like you know su700 is a tragically strange piece of sampling technology from the late 90s was it or it was early noughties but it's just like like no one treasures those now, um, and I don't think they'll ever come back. Do you know what I mean? They're not, they're not mm -hmm. high time or high due a sort of some kind of hipster resurgence. Like they're they're just going to be consigned to the bins of history, or maybe not. It's gonna, what do yeah, I know? It's going to disappear in the annals of history. Yeah, this is literally what they said about the three hundred three, isn't it? Like. Uh, I know if, if only I'd known at the time, if only I'd known. Yeah, of course, yeah. um, but of course, I didn't know what the value of those things was, even though, you know, one of the first pieces of equipment I bought was an RM1X, which is an absolutely astonishingly capable live sequencer. Like you can just do incredible work on that. It's basically the sequencers that are, well, I think, from what I understand, not being that much of an expert on it, but... They are basically the sequencer derivatives from the things that are in like the QY700 and, um, you know, as used by Square Pusher and co. So it's just like, like I had really good gear. I just wasn't, I wasn't using it in the way that I would use gear now, but that's hindsight for you. No, but that also has to do with, of course, with the information available to you at that time. Because nowadays, if you want to learn something, you just go to YouTube and you find it and you are immediately educated. And that was, of course, different in those times. It was. It was also like, in a sense, I didn't have a brother that was like, go and learn about Detroit techno. Like, mm -hmm. although they did, you know, we did have like, um, there was some Detroit techno actually in fairness, but it wasn't, it wasn't like I could see how other people were using the same equipment that I used. And I think that's the sort of, what's amazing about YouTube is the fact that, you know, I can go and if I was researching the SU700 and say YouTube existed back when it was actually released, I'd probably find some like videos of people with a SU700 and a few other bits, and but not much else jamming on mm -hmm. YouTube. And I'd be like, oh, that's how you can use it. Like, it's not like a sound module that you program from Cubase. You can actually just jam on this bit of equipment and a few other things like that whole concept of like, mixer jamming which of course is what so many musicians had been had worked out for the last 40 50 years you know it hadn't occurred to me yeah. um so it's sort of i guess i had i had some inspiration but i didn't have all the inspiration so you know i've had to take a circuitous circuitous route around it all and of course educate yourself at the same time at least yeah yeah, like just try stuff. Like, I mean, the first way that I, I had the Iron Run X, but I used it like a sound module and I programmed it from Cubase. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't actually use its own built-in sequence. I don't think I ever sequenced anything on the device itself, which was sort of silly, but I just didn't, I wasn't that bothered about it. You know, I used it the way I wanted. And then I suppose I've come full circle and I can, now I can use stuff tabletop gear and jam on it but i can also say well you know i did and do you know still also understand other ways of making music so it's i guess i've just tried lots of things because i didn't know what i was supposed to be doing with them um and bit by bit you just you experiment but it's always been it's always been a joy like it was interesting how i had no idea that i would be wisely spending my money by buying music equipment i didn't know that i would like it i just thought yeah. I like the idea of it, and so I'm going to have a go at it. Um, and it has proved to be, like, the best hobby. It's just, like, great. You know what I mean? It's like a lifetime of music making is just a brilliant 
hobby to be preoccupied with because there's always new... I mean, even... I was about to say there's always new equipment, but it's not a very healthy thing to say. It's more just like even with the same equipment, there's always new melodies and new tunes to be discovered. Like your, mm-hmm. your equipment is a sort of conduit to the ideas that you can come up with. And it's like, so, and that's the joy of electronic music is it's so free and open that it can be anything. So, you know, if you've got a sampler and a sequencer, then you already have more than you'll ever explore in a lifetime because you can literally harness any sound that you can find and take it in, turn it into music. It's like the most wonderful, gratifying, amazing limitless instrument and that's basically why electronic music's better than everything uh, better than guitars and then of course following that train of thought then modular is a is a logical next step of course when you <laughs> say well okay, we want to we want to just take anything that we what we get thrown at us and we can make electronic music with it so how did that came to be the actual step from 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 tabletop devices um standalone synths to to modular is, was that a um, was that something that just happened organically, or was it a, a conscious decision? Or it happened. Yeah, I tell you how it happened. We, weirdly, and I don't know where I got this idea from, but I wanted an MS Twenty, mm-hmm. and because I'm like you, bloody you kids these days who could go into a shop and just <laughs> buy one, like you couldn't get one because they were they weren't around like and there weren't you know there wasn't at least at the time there probably were internet marketplaces but for some stupid reason it didn't occur to me that i could possibly just actually buy someone's old ms20 or maybe didn't know how to find one and so Mm -hmm. i started looking at modern alternatives can i find like a modern synth that's like the ms20 i think maybe because of mr wazo i think because of mr wazo i must have been like this just sounds incredible how do i get that sound and so um i couldn't find an ms20 and i was looking at alternatives and i was like well there are a few really boutique ways that you can get a modular synth and one is a thing from a company called macbeth and it's called an M5. I was like, I can't, I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, but then I found this alternative, which was actually cheaper, significantly cheaper than the M5, seemed very compact, and it was called a Schwemann S1. And, of course, oh, wow. it wasn't that cheap. It was like 1,500 quid. And you might rightly ask, how did I possibly scrum up 1500 pounds and the answer is my grandparents had given me a sum of money to buy a car with and I spent that on a Schwaben S1 (laughs) I was like I don't need a car I'm not gonna need a car I live in London like I don't need a car I need a synth so I'm gonna spend all this money that you bought you they've saved thinking ahead to this like upwardly mobile grandson that they'd be enabling and he's just spunked it on a on a bloody synthesizer and that is exactly what i did i spent every penny on a schwaben s1 that you would show up every weekend in your brand new or yeah. second hand car yeah mm. i guess i was a but bad still, grandson is a great investment it really course. well hey you know see this is the thing I think I think actually it was seventeen hundred pounds because I recall I sold it for fifteen hundred um, because I was uh, I sold it in two thousand and eight for fifteen hundred pounds and of course we all know that Schwaben S ones become far more valuable um, and I could have sold it for a lot more money but when I tell you what I sold it for it was I sold it to bankroll more travel when i left my job and went to travel around the world so actually i think i think i had the i probably spent in fact i unquestionably converted the money that my grandparents had bought for me to buy a car into the best thing i possibly could which wasn't a schwaben s1 it was international travel because that is actually again yeah 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 i suppose i just but it was but that that trip was by far the best thing i've ever done with money so i can't particularly I think it was actually, it's all worked out very well. But the Schwemann S1 was, it was awesome, but it wasn't, it wasn't an MS20 because what I really wanted was this filthy, filthy, dirty, 
brutal, wild thing. That's what I thought a modular synth was going to be. And the Schwemann S1, though, I discovered is capable of filthy, dirty, wild, but you really have to kind of know it well enough, and I probably didn't. And I remember getting some wild stuff out of it, but thinking, ah, oh, this wasn't really it. And when I got back from travelling, I was like, I really want to try again. I want to find some dirty little wild modular synth. And at the time, Dupfer had come out with the Dark Energy. And I was like, look at that. It's tiny, affordable. This is about all that I can, got, can scrounge you know, money for at this stage. I'll get the Dark Energy. And I got the Dark Energy and sold it within a week because it was like I'd tasted a sort of, I don't know, it's, it's probably not a... I don't know where I'm going with this analogy. It's like I tasted some kind of forbidden fruit and I wanted the whole tree. <laughs> I wanted all that fruit. So I I was just immediately, it was obvious that I needed loads of, I needed like a lot more than just what the dark energy was capable of. So I was like, right, get rid of it. And then I started to invest in Eurorack. And that's, uh, I don't know when that was, seven, eight years ago, maybe six, seven years, something like that. Um, and then it, it sort of snowballed as it does. <laughs> as I think everyone in the audience can attest to that that's how it typically starts. It starts with that 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 yearning. And then of course once you dive into it, then it then it happens, of course. But I've I've, I've read about the, the journey you had then had to actually go from 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 working with modular into actually well filming videos that you say, okay, well I want to sell some some modules. And I started to make videos of those. But when did the when did the actual realization come? Okay, well, but this is something I can keep on doing, and not just for um, uh, for to sell a module or to get a module. Mm. I think it was a gradual thing. It's not. There's no point where you just go like, oh, I make videos about modular synths now. Um, and I, you know, I'm trying to. Yeah, I do try and broaden it because that's not. You know, the thing is, it's if, if someone thought that all I did was play with modules, that's just definitely not the case. Like, hence the sort of 21 year journey means that I've literally got all types of music equipment in, the, well, not like electronic music equipment, but I've got, like, got a room with like, I've got polysynths, I've got, you know, H3000 and like some, some nice outboard and like, and lots of other gear that. Um, I use in a kind of, or want to use in a modular way. I say want to because I, it's long and complicated, but basically my studio is not built. It's in a state of unbuilt at the moment, but it will be built eventually. And yeah. um, I guess and the other thing is software. Like I'm like actively been making music with software for like 20, well, not 20 years, but probably, no, it is for bloody 20 years because I started on Cubase and MIDI sequencing and, and so, anyway, it's just, um, it's not just one thing, basically. It's it's all things. And modular is a part of it. Um, yeah. And it's a, great, it's a great system because you can build systems, because you can build these little instruments that can be focused. Um, it's just really easy to be non-focused with, and that's the poison of it, isn't it? That it's easy to just sort of pile it on like I wanted to pile it on. Um, but it's I uh, just like with the rest of electronic music, I took a circuitous route in, you know, I learned, I, and I've already, even now I've got like a lot of modules that don't make sense, they don't work together, they're not part of a system, and so um, you know it takes time, and um, but it's nice having them <laughs> in the sense, uh, it's not just nice having them, it's nice having them because then. Sometimes if you think, I really want to build a system to do this, then you've actually got the means to do so. You know, you've got, I'm like, I'll put this, this, this together and they become a little thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it is hard. Like, yeah, uh, I forgot where we were going with this and what the question was, uh, but it was something to do with making videos, which is, oh, yeah, like, yeah. what point you realise, yeah, yeah, I don't know. And it's... Um, there's lots of other... But it's a weird thing, is the whole making videos. As you've discovered, I'm sure it's... Um, it unfortunately because it's so time consuming it, it can be mutually exclusive to actually you know using the equipment there has to be a balance and it's really hard because it is incredibly time consuming it's like brutally time consuming and i have to try and fit it around like a life and a family and and other work and just just 
it it's non-trivial um but it it is totally great and it's it's like it's so gratifying to hear people say like you know and get messages from people saying that they got into this because they saw a video that i made and i was like that's really good like that's actually that's the point of all of this because that's what i didn't have when you know if I can show a video of saying how here's a simple application of modular that might click with someone and, and, and show them a way that could be that they lead them down a path and they'll follow their own nose, you know, that's just amazing. And that's what I didn't have when I was starting up because I didn't see how I could be doing tabletop techno with my RM1X and my SU700. And um, where would I be now if I'd worked that out at that point? I don't know. It's all fine. It's all come full circle. I've learned things along the way, but um, it's it's awesome that we can inspire each other, and you know, in an immediate and global way. That if you if you seek inspiration, yeah. you'll find it on YouTube. Like that's it's just amazing. Yeah, and of course, well, I should say, well, you want to inspire people, and of course, we, we probably the best known example of that is, of course, Ben Divkid, who actually will credited you to. Uh, to inspire him to start on his personal journey. And that's, of course, a great, a great feat that, that I'm assuming you're quite proud of. But that's, of course, that, that is the, the key thing here is, of course, it's on the one hand, it's educating, it's inspiring, it's, um, it's, it's challenging people as well. Mm. Yeah, it's fun to be provocative, I suppose. And that's like, I see that as part of what I'm supposed to be doing is just like asking questions, pointing things out. I don't have the answers like, you know, and, and anyone who's looking at like the live system thing should understand. I'll be like, wait a minute. Like he seems to change this completely after thinking he's discovered the, the way it works. And it's, it should be readily apparent that it's because I'm literally trying everything that I can. And that's part of the, the luxury and sort of the role, I suppose, is that I, I'm able to get hold of things more cheaply or, you know, even for free in some instances. So I can just try things and then I can just publicly explain, you know, did they work or not? And I suppose at the end of the day, all of it is is personal enough. So it's I hope people realize that it's like you take from it what you want. You know, you if you are looking at what someone's doing, and I'm super inspired, like recently I mentioned this before, but like this guy, Olan. O L A N exclamation mark. I watched like a couple of his videos. I came across him and he's like a modular performer, techno guy. I was just like yeah. instantly inspired. Like, and I mean, by watching what he's doing, how he's certain things that he's doing. For example, um, he's got um, like, oh, my monitor's just turned off. I hope the, oh, yeah, you can hear me. Can you hear me? I still hear you. No okay, worries. Okay, good. Uh, uh, he was. What was he doing? Oh, he was using, he's got the WMD performance mixer that's got mutes built in while you add on. And I'm like using push button toggle mutes. I was like, you absolute legend. Like that, that is such a useful system for being able to switch things in and out very quickly. And it's something that is a common workflow. I hate that term, but workflow thing in, um, Groove boxes and physical devices, electron things, all of them have buttons that toggle things on and off because that's just what happens when you have buttons as your way of doing it. Very few of them have switches, like your physical switches, but so many modules have physical switches because in modules, it's the simplest way of doing it because you can just wire things through the switch and when the switch is off, then it breaks the connection. Um, and it was a bit of a eureka moment of realizing that if you go to the trouble of finding modules that have push button switches, you can much more easily turn a bunch of things off and turn a bunch of things on at the same time, and thereby kind of flipping things in and out, sort of, um, you know, swapping things on a sixpence. <coughs> Excuse me. And yeah, it was just like that was from going on a bit of a YouTube binge and seeing how this guy was using it. Another one was that he had he had the LS1 light strip and he'd wired it so that that would just high pass his whole mix. You know, he was having it so that his whole mix was going through a high pass filter and the LS1 light strip was controlling that high pass. So he could just drag his finger down and make the whole mix go like, Wah! you know, and sort of high pass up for your big sick drops. I was like, that works really well. Like, it's such a... Because actually, if you physically turn a high-pass knob, 
it's yeah. very hard to very quickly turn it up and whip it back down in a split second, whereas those LS1 strips, you can very easily slowly move something up and just return it to its original position in, in like a millisecond. Um, so, yeah, things like that. I was just like, I watched that and I was immediately tore apart my live system. And actually this, this sort of video that I posted recently, which is a live set, is yeah. with the system configured very much like OLAN. <laughs> um, and it worked. You know, it's like, I mean, I'm not practiced enough, but I suppose what I'm saying here is that I'm I'm taking inspiration from other people and just telegraphing it out. And then and then we'll just explain. And I hope people just take with from it what they think is valuable and what clicks in their mind. Uh, but because they're going to have to discover that it, it might not, or it might, or they might be like, no, here's a better way of doing it. And that's how it should be. Um, yeah, absolutely, and it's all about that that that, that cross pollination of, of of all artists that's going to drive ourselves to uh, to further greatness. Of course, um, I've got so many questions for you, Alex, but I I do have to uh, open it up for uh, for the audience as well. Um, so, <sighs> as I said, so what I would like to do is I would like to just ask people that have a question for you to just raise their hands. It's already I've, I've seen shock. Blaster uh, being probably the first one to actually raise his hand. Do, do we want to invite him on, or um, do you know him? I don't. I don't know. I, I thought he'd never ask. We've got to get we've got to get Shot Blaster up here. Hey, let's see. Let's see. So uh, let's get him up here. If he if he dares, of course. <laughs> I'm about to be shocked. <laughs> there we go. Hey, nice Shock on there. there um uh how are well, you i'm doing not all right because i've gotten testing problems which is fun not really wouldn't recommend it oh you got intestine problems oh, i hope you're okay it's uh, um, i've been feeling the health problems myself i'm tripping for it like a tree irish man <laughs> oh. um, and you've had your hand up from from the moment we started, so I, I'm assuming you've got a burning question either for for Alex or myself. Uh, actually, um, not a burning question, but I just I did uh, not very good at talking. Um, I actually wanted to show off some stuff that I I can I've got made if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'll post them on the companion channel. It's just like with some voice acting I can have done that uh, I'm okay, okay with showing. Because uh, they're oh, all free to share, of course. Yeah, no problem there whatsoever. Because I am making a Transformers game, and I'm voicing some characters from the game. Nice. That's really nice. No, but feel free, and we'll. Uh, I think we can say we'll uh, we'll listen to it, of course. Yeah, I've also got music made for the game as well, and it's actually, I'd say, pretty, in my opinion, at least, it's decent music. Mm -hmm. Sounds legit. Oh, post that as well. Can't wait. But um, yeah. Oh, perfect. We'll uh, we'll listen to this. Any uh, any additional questions? Let me just move to the next one. We already have. Who do we have? We've got. Ursa Solem, of course, the lonely bear who's got a question. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Jesper and, and Alex. Thank you for doing these shows. They're always really informative. Um, I just wanted to ask Alex, um, after having seen several of your videos and the systems that you've built, um, I've noticed that there is often a tendency for uh, single, uncomplicated modules that have like one very specific job and that you tend to use a lot of them to achieve like one single kind of concept like in the way that you would use uh, sequ sequential switches for example mm -hmm. um so i guess like my question is like when do you uh like how and when do you make the decision to choose um like a single um component made of several smaller modules that will achieve one purpose as opposed to um, reaching for something like Mimeophone, which can do like several different things at once. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, 
I guess you, you look at the amount of space that you have available and you're kind of, I, I suppose I'm thinking at a high level about how many voices do I want to have? What sort of, you know, result do you want? And then it kind of, it zones in on certain, I, I guess I think of big things first. So I'm like, well, I need a baseline. I need a, you know, some kind of malleable digital voice. I need a bit of effects. I need this and a mixer and stuff. And so kind of once you've catered with those things, then you're, you're kind of like, well, what have I got space left for? Um, and then it's a question of like, how well can I wield those things? Like how, how much can I keep them alive and interesting without like, without help from other modules? And then I suppose it's just a question of then I'm trying to think like by playing, after playing with those things, I'm like, what was boring? Like what needed animation? What needed movement? What was I trying to do that I couldn't? And I suppose those kinds of questions lead you to say, well, I really need to like tickle this with a bit of like LFO. And so now I need to fit an LFO. And now I, you know, it'd be good if I had a few and here's the module I have and it'll fit in the space. And so, so it's sort of thinking in those terms, you then start to fill up the edges, you know, fill up the corners as it were. And then you're like, oh, I pretty much run out of space now. And then it's a question of, how well can you wield it? And then you just have to like look in the mirror and be like, well, I really, I'm still finding that X thing is hard on this system or it doesn't sound very good or it gets boring or it, it you know, isn't dynamic enough or whatever. And then, then you can sort of go, well, what has to go? And it's sort of, it's iterative. Um, I'm not like, I guess I'm not clever enough to think always from the start like exactly what the entire patch will be but um i try to just think in terms of like the problems i'm trying to solve and then if you've you know if you learn the functions of the burn there's not that many modules really at the end of the day when there are thousands of modules but i mean like when you think in terms of functions there's not that many there's like routing and like filtering and thinking at higher levels about those. And you think, well, I'm trying to do that. You arrive at a point where like, I'm just trying to do this, you know, um, I'm just trying to, I don't know if it was, let's say, bring, make things alive, then you might think, well, if I had a sequential switch and one LFO and I wanted to modulate multiple things, then I could send that one LFO into the input of the sequential switch and then sequentially move it around the system or, do you know what I mean? It's sort of that kind of thing. But um, I wouldn't, I'd probably arrive at that having not put it in to start with and then subsequently put it in. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, um, but it's iterative and it's based on actually using it and, and actually being frustrated or unhappy with what came out of it. And then, then you just go, well, how can I make it better? And does it need more dynamics? And I suppose those, that's the only thing is, is kind of knowing what does it really need is, it is hard. And it, I guess that comes through experience of making music and just listening to loads of music and, um, and being sort of realistic, which is always hard. <laughs> I'm trying to be like, you know, uh, what's the word? Just gen, you know, genuine. It's hard. Like, um, it's that difference between taking like snaps on your phone and taking like actual photographs are two different things. Like, just snapping and snapping and snapping versus carefully composing photos are two different sort of beasts. And I suppose it's the same with making music on a modular. It's like just making some sound on a modular is not the same thing as producing complete music and it's it's just trying to be realistic about that so that you can be honest about what's coming out which is hard because it's so easy to be like whatever you've made is great but it's only when you listen back weeks later and you're like when you've you know you've lost that sort of initial honeymoon period and you're like actually no it's crap <laughs> um, and i've been better off just doing this in like ableton live you know <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. The whole agile approach of actually doing it in an iterative, iterative fashion is, of course, it's the it's the basis of modular, I think, as well. Hope that answers your question. Don't know if it does. Uh, it does, and then some. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Cheers. Now we've got ZBS. Let me just invite you to the stage. If that works. 
There we go. CBS is the course. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Hey, friends. Hey, Alex. I've been following your channel for a number of years at this point. And um, I was just thinking the other day, uh, you had a live system walkthrough a long time ago where you were talking about talking to Absidic, um, where he had recommended that you switch to a more kind of predetermined rhythm and melody system as opposed to. I don't remember which video it is, but you probably know what I'm talking about. I do, yeah. Versus like, yeah. Um, I was wondering, that was a bunch of years ago now, and I was wondering if if you, um, what your opinion on that kind of dichotomy is at this point in your current system. Like, are you still leaning heavily on full improv or are you are you implementing kind of more predetermined elements at all? Or like, yeah, what's your thought on that? That is a good question. And yeah, basically, he, it was the th- third why we bleep i think um basically he yeah as you say he had found that he just couldn't make improv a success i i don't think that's necessarily the answer like as in you can definitely make improv a success you unquestionably can make improv a success and do so if like you're stevia. if you're stevio and you have <laughs> i think it requires like it if you've got a big enough system and if you've got a focused enough style where you can, where it's kind of okay that it sounds samey for want of a better term and harsh that that may sound is like, but you know, if it, if it's yeah, a certain mean. type of music, then that's fine. Uh, and it is fine and it, and it can work and it means that you know what you're supposed to be making. But um, the answer is like, I'm, I'm definitely curious to find a hybrid and so, like, the recent, very recent ch- case change that I've done, I've not made a sort of other video about, is um, has got, like, a SWT 16 plus, Sweet 16, um, because I wanted a sequencer that had the ability. Basically, I really like grids. I love grids. I think it's great. But there's just something about much dumber, simpler patterns that a human makes on a Zox style sequencer. And I mm. kind of wanted to ensure that I still had those. So, you know, the kinds of patterns that I make when I someone gives me 16 buttons with lights in, like I wanted to just be able to make sure that I could still, I uh, had some of those in there. And so basically in that, in this current iteration, I've got both grids for the random sort of, not random, but like for the, yeah, throw generally. the dice yeah 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 for like the kind of i'm not quite sure what's going to happen but i've also got like set rhythms that i've made but that are set and pre pre-prepared and i can flip to in a moment um and so like and i'm also considering i haven't done this but i you know i've got the metropolis in the system and i'd like to have some presets in metropolis that are riffs that i've made and also I have, um, I mulled over the idea of like having both a Metropolis and a Metropolix. So you have mm. the Metropolix with preset melodies and the Metropolis without. And sort of trying to find a, a some kind of halfway house. And I, the answer is like, you don't have to do that. Um, you can make it work totally improv. And you can mm. obviously make it work brilliantly, completely not improv. And the audience yeah, won't totally. know any of the difference between either of them, except it's more likely that you'll have a good show if you don't improv. <laughs> so <laughs> make of that what you will. But, uh, you know, hence, ugh, I don't know. It's, um, I don't I don't have a good answer in the sense that there's no, what I'm doing is probably going to lead to worse music, all things considered, than the alternative. But, oh, it's a totally different process, though. Yeah. I, I hear you, yeah. It's difficult. Like, But then what I'll, you know, if you were to predetermine it, then you, that's your show and you have to keep rewriting your show uh, for people to hear different things. And that might be fine as well. I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of playing with a hybrid process at the moment. So I'm, I'm trying to see if I can have my cake and eat it. That's awesome. I feel like there's a bit of a, a dearth of like a style of module where that has a generative system or like a algorithmic system like grids, but then that you can also like set it and then edit it. There's, you know, like it would print it onto a 
onto yeah. a Zox sequencer, then then you could edit it. I feel like that'd be so useful. I have actually suggested this exact idea to to companies, and they won't listen. Oh, yeah. They don't listen to you. Like <laughs> they know yeah. what they know what they're doing, and they make <laughs> a lot more money than I'll ever make. So what you know, fair that's, enough. That's a good perspective. Uh, but but yeah, I th- like you could do that though if you just you know if you literally strapped a grids and a Zox style sequencer, and you just you know hit record. Uh, well, you. You, yeah, actually, yeah, if you could record into it, but more, you could just literally mix the channels. So it's like, you know, you mix the results. Mm. So you've got a mixture of things you make and things that it has made. You can make that. And that's the beauty of modular is if you feel like it's stupid that this doesn't exist, well, you can actually make it. It's just you may need more HP than you can fit on an airline carry on. That's the only problem. But who's taking so flying anywhere these days other than people who get to go to Super Booth? <laughs> <laughs> The um, the today's announcement from uh, Podular Modcast, you can create your own module. Yes, <laughs> with your face <laughs> on it. I'm looking forward to doing that. If I get face on it. That's one of the important things, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your questions, EBS. Um, now we've got Split Radax. Let me just Speaking invite of your people home. who went to Super Booth. Oh, I'm I'm, I'm so. I was planning to go, and then I, I decided to not go uh, just a couple of weeks beforehand, and I'm, I'm, I'm dreading my decision. I've got all the hindsight knowledge now, and I can, can just keep on telling myself I should have gone. I should have gone. Should have gone. Yeah. How was yeah, it, it was by great, the way? Great fun. <laughs> hello, everybody, and hello, Alex. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? I am good, thank you. I'm just recovering from Berlin. I was going to say, have you got like a sort of four or five day hangover at this point? <laughs> yeah, it's like that. That's why my voice is kind of even a bit lower than usual. <laughs> so my question was, in the world of electronic music making, what do you think that modular is not so great for and that you would advise people to not use it for when making music? Oh, that's a good question. I was about to say just making music. It's not that great. I don't know. It's like, I would say it's not so great. This is a sort of stupid, weird thing. I don't know. I mean, there's about a billion things it's not great for. I was going to say for getting fast results. Like I'm thinking of, you know, if you've got your, as you do, two of everything. But I mean, if you've got like a, a Nord, you know, a Nord lead and you've got a load of presets in it that you love, you're going to write music a hell of a lot faster than you are if you try to invent each sound from scratch in turn with a modular synth. Um, and maybe it means that you have to be disciplined and actually separate the sound design and the, the writing process. But um, modular is just like, it's just not a quick way to particularly do anything. Um, with that said, unless you've built the modular to like make the whole track and you've gone to the trouble of finishing it so that you can just make the whole tune then and there. Um, in which case, yes, it's incredibly fast, but it might take you eight years to get to the point where you can either afford or have worked out the configuration that lets you do that. So I don't know. The, the joke is I think it's really bad for writing music. I think it's a really bad option for it. <laughs> potentially is like a sound module. I can also imagine, yeah, if you've got your circle on and you've got the, the, you know, the, the expander and you've got a few basic modules, then you could treat them like you've got like five SH-101s in front of you and you can just quickly tweak them and stuff. But it's, it's, not, it's not quicker than using a 101, which is a far simpler, more elegant device where everything's set up and, you know, you're not going to have like, oh, no, I've accidentally pulled out one of the cables and so it doesn't really work properly it's just not particularly quick for writing music. That's what it's terrible at. Um, but I think if you have the discipline to separate sound design and writing, you've got plenty of time. Um, but I just, I don't know. I'm not that patient. I don't know if you, do you, when you're circloning, do you actually, do you, uh, you must be, are you doing all synthesis or do you actually sample and do you create the samples on the fly? Rarity sampling. It's almost all just straight out of the modular of the synths. Because it's quicker, basically. Yeah, basically, yeah, because the sampling just slows you down. Exactly. But then that's, there's this sort of litany of artists for whom, like Square Pusher and Aphex, where it's like sampling is art form and sampling combined with hardware sequencing, which 
I, I mean, I get the sense that like people like Square Pusher, he's literally just he's got his he has I suppose a very limited amount of things that actually produce the sound. Like he's got his Orville and an SH101, a CS80, and a bass, and so it's like you've got a limited selection of inputs, and you've really only got one effect. So maybe it's not so painful. And I know he's built his own sampling like rig in reactor so maybe he's built something that's efficient to sample to but i don't know it's just the idea that like if you were using a modular if you thought well i'm gonna have a modular a sampler and a sequencer which is something that i've thought about i've actually i'm i'm not built but i will be building into my vcs3 case like a, a model 15 but like a modular model 15 with like a, and i think it will be amazing and i think about that like wouldn't it be cool if I had that Model 15, a sampler in the circle on? But I think it would just be really bloody slow. I think it would be much better if I just separated the processes, spent like two evenings just making sounds and throwing them into the sampler, and then spent the next two evenings just writing music, using those samples, but with the modular switched off. It's just that thing of like, it's a rabbit hole that is unproductive if you're in the heat of actually trying to write melodies. Um, That's separating the sample library making from the making music as exactly. a good idea as well. Yeah. In fact, I interviewed Tony from Make Noise and he said, he, what was his exact words? He was like, sampling is like kind of this one stage. He was talking about the digitact versus digitone. And he's like, you know, all things said, I'm kind of a bit more drawn to the digitone because sampling is like one step removed from making music, a step that I kind of don't feel like taking a lot of the time. I don't know exactly what he means because it's like when you're just trying to like write a tune, you're like, I just can't be asked to now stop writing music for a, an hour while I find the perfect sample. So I really don't know how like DJ Shadow does it, did it. Answer, very in-depth. <laughs> You are, sorry. <laughs> in-depth. I can't tell A really in-depth answer, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Great question. Thanks so much, uh, Split Radex. So maybe then a, a quick question uh, in the meantime. Um, what was your biggest, well, surprise or your biggest news from Superbooth, uh, Alex? Um... Uh, what, what, what happened at Superbooth? Um, yes, there were quite a few good things. I'm just trying to think through what I'm actually like. I don't know, like the, I'm trying to think what I'm actually, what would I actually want to possess? I do like the idea of the Super 6 desktop because mm -hmm. that thing is just like the Super 6 is just absolutely stunning. Like, it is a stunningly, stunningly amazing sounding synthesizer. And I, at some point, I've got to have one. But um, so the desktop sort of appeals, maybe also because I didn't, I don't like the kind of baby blue. And I don't like the grey because it's grey and blue when it should really be like black and orange. Like, I really don't know why they don't do just like a Jupiter colour scheme one. And if they did that, I would just get it like... They, I don't know. Anyway, they're they're forging a different path. But I thought that um, the nymphs sounded like amazing, and it's sort of it's like yeah, yeah, like that just sounds incredible. Like, and it's sort of it's a bit like a Juno. Maybe it's a bit like a Jupiter Four as well. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't dug into like massively, but it just seems really like vibey and like a great, great thing, like a little six-voice Juno-style thing in a tiny little box. Should be celebrated and is wonderful and great. Um, I'm also really, really excited to finally see the Osmos, like having played with a prototype of the Osmos, like that, that like the prototype I played, which I played at Superbooth uh, about two years ago, um, behind closed doors, like it really is incredible because it's not um it's just that fact that when you you know if you use any of the sort of mpe style keyboards if you if you just like feather the key you know just like ever so slightly depress it on any of the sort of 
MPE type things. It doesn't really do anything until you've pressed it maybe half a centimeter or so. There's a kind of delay. Whereas the Osmos really does and it resists your fingers in a way. So it's kind of, it's a bit weird. Whereas on a piano, if you kind of tap it, a piano will yeah. kind of, a piano key will kind of fly down and sort of it, it this doesn't really have that because it's pushing against you. But an interesting, yet another Tony Make Noise thing is at the very beginning of the podcast, and this is actually it's the podcast that will be out next soon, hopefully. Um, he he talks about the CS80 because Tony can and should buy himself a CS80. Um, and so he owns one. He's like, the keys kind of give, like they, sorry, they resist, like you've got to bite into them a little bit. And his description of that like sounded like what I remember the Osmos being like um, in the sense that it resists you a little bit. And that resistance is what lets you kind of really control how you're biting into the keyboard and really create well-articulated swells. Um, and I'm not a keyboardist by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm still really excited to play that keyboard because there's no other keyboard that works that way. And from a synth perspective, like the Egan Matrix is just like, yeah. it is just like mind-blowingly deep. When you consider that you can apply like logic operations to the interconnections, it's like patch cables with logic built in. Um, and it's like, it, it it really couldn't exist any other way. So it's not like, it, do you know what I mean? As in it's, it's going to be yeah. far more powerful. It's going to be a very powerful modular synthesizer that is also polyphonic and it is also has the most expressive kind of way of interacting. So it's sort of, it really is like, it's going to be an amazing thing when it finally comes out. It's, it just sounds crackers. Um, so that you know, there's loads of exciting things. Um, I can't remember what yeah. else was. I don't know what you. What was your sort of exciting takeaway? Well, one of the things that I truly loved, and I see a lot of things happening in the chat as well, is I was well. I've been in contact with Gur for quite some time from Tipchalk, and he's been quite secretive over the last uh, couple of months. Yep. And I'm like, hey, what's happened to Gur? I'm not sure because typically I got pretty quick responses from him and he was always sharing what he was working on and he went silent for a while and then of course the whole, the, the whole thing happens and I was just surprised and and intrigued because they've 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 done what everyone was silently dreaming about I think I've uh, I I've I actually managed to forget entirely about that. And that's, yes, that is by far the most, <laughs> the most exciting thing that has come out of it. It's certainly the most exciting Eurorack thing. Although there is the, you can get the Egan Matrix as a Euromat module. So I suppose that's, oh, yeah. but given how much I was bigging it up, then I think that has to be exciting too. But yes, you're absolutely, like this Buchla, Buchla tip top is bonkers. Like that is, it's very interesting. It's very interesting both as a product and it's very interesting the pricing that they're going for um i'm excited to see it and like i really hope i can get hold of some of it um and so it's i don't know it's the bookla stuff is i don't know it very well because i've never had an opportunity to really play on it beyond playing it's music mythical, right? it is mythical like who do you know that's got a 200 system or a 200 e I mean, I'd, actually, I know a few people, but, but, um, but you know, it, it's just not common. And um, especially the older systems, they're not. They're, no one, like, they're just not. So it really is a, a, a great, great thing, a great democratisation of, um, of something that would otherwise be unobtainium. Um, and it's, yeah, just like, I'm just like hungry for more now. I might like, bring them out and let's roll on the next things like you know you're gonna do the math or whatever it is and um the 292 i guess is yeah. the sort of isn't that the obvious i don't know much about bukla but it's kind of like you know those are kind of a couple of the the other sort of big modules that you'd assume and i'm sure they will do at some point um but yeah good on Gur and like he's such a good guy he's such a really you know really genuine like dude so i do wish them all the best i hope it I hope it all works out. Well, I'm I'm pretty sure it will work out because I think that the whole Eurorack 
community was standing on their uh, on their chairs when that when that yeah, news hit. Definitely. <laughs> The, the biggest problem he's going to have is, of course, what, what all the uh, the makers have currently is, will they be able to produce enough? Yeah, I don't know what, yeah, I guess it's, um, I don't know how, to what extent they're affected by the chip thing. I mean, I know the chip thing is a huge issue for the microcontrollers, um, yeah. but then there shouldn't be any microcontrollers in this stuff. But if you were doing like a MARF, I know that there's that um, clone one that does use a microcontroller just because it's an easier way of doing it. I suppose it depends the extent to which they're or how they're doing it but but i also i'm i'm not a manufacturer and it could well be and i, I think i believe it is like other things are affected other materials pcb may you know manufacture and other bits and bobs that you need are also hard to get hold of yeah i've actually heard from some manufacturers that even just the um the knobs for pot meters have been well <laughs> have yeah. been delayed months on end yeah. so yeah i think has been impacted either by the chip shortages or even by the Suez Canal. Yeah. Uh, or like or that's almost like well, a few months ago already. Yeah, yeah, but it'll have a knock-on effect. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, it's it takes it's literally you know shipping takes six weeks because it's it is on a ship, so that you know there is you know, there are going to be huge like delayed onsets. I mean, it's I read a bit about it and it it kind of is a thing, um, but I'm not a I'm not a logistics person. I just drive them. I don't know how, what makes them work. Oh, well, at least we've got Kyle from Signal Sound saying he's got a bunch of spare ports if everyone, anyone wants to buy. It's Kyle <laughs> uh, who... Uh, Kyle, yeah. did you send me this Binkleflex 94? Did you send me this monstrosity? <laughs> what I have here. Let me just check. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was him. Yeah, he's, Thank he's you, just Kyle. <laughs> can, Kyle, can you come up and talk to me about that? I'd like to speak to you on the mic, if you can. You're put on the spot there, Kyle. Come. <laughs> You're okay with that. Come here. <laughs> I want to ask you about this. In the meantime, while uh, Kyle um, uh, gathers some things, we did get a question from the audience uh, through the chat. So this is from Making Sound Machines. No mic ready, so question for your chat. I would love to know more about the Why We Bleep podcast. How the idea came to be, and what was the hardest guest to get for the podcast, and who would Alex love to have on in the future? Oh. Uh, the podcast is like, I basically, I was inspired, I had an, about a million, billion years ago, I, I had an idea for a, a podcast, for a blog uh, called um, How Do You... What is it? How do you make music? Which was like, ask a person like how they make music. Um, hi, Kyle. And um, the basically, that I didn't really go anywhere with that. And then podcasting became a thing. I enjoyed and listened to podcasts loads. And I got invited to be on a podcast. This sounds really big headed, but I was like, oh, I really enjoyed this. <laughs> now I'd like to make a podcast. Um, and so it's kind of that simple, really. I was just like, well, I can kind of this could be a thing i could do this and i know a lot of these people like saying sort of talking to Gurr and tony from make noise and stuff like because i've been involved with you know making videos and going to shows i kind of met a lot of these people i've met a lot of the press and i've sort of met a lot of artists and i was like well i've kind of got and I've, I've got like connections with people who work in the music industry and stuff so i've kind of got a lot i realized I was like, i've kind of got hookups so that i could get in touch with people and and so and so that's it you know you just and you just kind of make a start and try and it's it's great it's just it's a lot of work it takes a while to make and it doesn't you know it's small in the grand scheme it's not growing very very much um but that's kind of it's not also the end of the world like i kind of do enjoy it for its own sake quite honestly it is great to do and it's um yeah, I mean, in terms of got, like hard guests, I'm trying to think who is. It just depends. Um, the guests that I haven't had on yet are the hardest ones, the ones that I'm trying to get through to, um, but who either are too busy or not interested. You know, it's that sort of it's that thing. Not everyone's up for such things. Not everyone feels comfortable doing podcasts too. There's been artists who be I you know would have thought would be amazing. But I kind of like, yeah, I'm not really comfortable physically or, you know, or emotionally with going and doing podcasts, which is cool, you know. It is a bit weird and it's that sense of, I think people, some people feel like they'll be, you know, 
which feels odd to me because I know I wouldn't do this, but I think people are thinking like, oh, they'll be put on the spot and asked technical questions. People who sort of even uh, operating at a high level might feel that kind of, you know, that sort of, uh, what's the word? The, the fraud of, you know, oh, am I going to be quizzed about things that I don't know the answer to? I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that, obviously. We're not going to, I'm not here to like sh- say that I know more about something than you, which I obviously don't. Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know, uh, but it's it's great. They're vulnerable, of course. Yeah, of course they they they're they're vulnerable when you actually have them on the spot and you do ask any question. Just like Kyle, uh, like Kyle now. Come on, Kyle. It's just he's breaking his sweat. Probably, like. <laughs> I'm just looking at the dog. It's the dog face. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Is that working? Yeah. Hi. 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 Tell me about Kyle. Can you describe yes. the Binkle Flex ninety four? Um, yeah, it's a uh, well. You 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 invented it, right? <laughs> yeah, I, and did, your yeah. little, um, I did. <laughs> uh, made up since sponsored message thing, and then I I drew one as a joke, as some like yes marketing stuff, and then uh, you asked what was new at Superbooth. You said there wasn't going to be anything, mm. and I'm like. The Binkle Flex is a thing. <laughs> and then I uh, ran and put one together. Just popped uh, one together. But what? So yeah. what is the actual, who is Emil Carr and what is False right. Ascension? What actually is it? Right. So he's a friend of mine. Right. And uh, we made these for the Glasgow Maker Fair like four years ago as like little kits. People could come and just like put one together, like learn how to solder kind of thing. Is it like a five so five five kind of buzzer thing? Yeah, it's an, it's, it's an Atari Punk console. Right. Uh, it's two five five fives, which I, to be honest, I don't know how it works. It's like just two square wave things, and one like does pulse width kind of, and one kind of does pitch, but not really. Um, I mean, for the uh, yeah. for viewers, I can just um, I'm holding a little like a pink box that has two knobs. One that says pitch sorter kind of pwm and not line out but lime out and also has some patch connections which if you lift the lid you can see that they're connected to absolutely nothing on the other side um and it's like it makes pwm sound and it's got a bit that like has anyone heard of like the crack dose crack deuce was that sort of like um mad like dutch like touch synth thing I remember like finding that online and there was this, I've got the bits to build one and then <laughs> never did anything with them. It kind of reminds you of that. Like, like kind of you one, haven't with, this on, on, on Instagram or on Twitter or anything? Yeah, I don't know. It's very old now, but it's like a, you know, there's a few of those kind of little like mad gadgets that just like make wicked bug music when you, when you, when you sort of mash them with your fingers. But yeah, no, thank you, Kyle, for sending me the right. the uh, the Binkle Flex ninety four. That was funny because uh, it literally was like like they sent it in the post without letting me know. So I was like, oh, oh it's here! Thank goodness. Yeah, I, I was then, hoping that would be okay because I, I realised that's slightly creepy that I could pick <laughs> up. Yeah. I was like, no, um, I think at this point, like we're all friends here. Uh, yeah. Also, what I liked, especially, I shared that on Instagram, like along with the video of my son playing it. Uh, and um, one of the people who liked it was the Chemical Brothers. Uh, so I was like, oh, wow. I was like, well, yeah, yeah, sell one to Tom and Ed or whatever. I'm sure they'd buy Binkle Flex 94 for their lovely studio. I do have, I do have about 200 of those PCBs. <laughs> yeah, well, um, maybe you start with one. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, we, we, we made so many to get the cost down, basically. So the, the full cost of that kit is about 50 pence. Oh, wow. All the parts. That doesn't diminish its value to me. No, just, absolutely. You know, I mean, the fact... most expensive bit by far is the battery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. You know? It's a nice battery. It's an, an industrial Duracell. Yeah, yeah it's lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, thank you very much for my lovely hey, gift. Bob. Yeah. Could you uh, share that in the, uh, in the, in the chat, uh, Kyle, because people are interested to see or look it up. Uh, uh, I'll have to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, you've got, you work for a shop. You've got some to sell. I see, I see how this could work. I'm not going to, no, I'm not no, going to inflict that on anyone. Give them away. The, free. Uh, the box is from um, Winterbloom, by the way. Is it? Yeah, so that's their little kit boxes they do stuff in, which is really nice. It it's is, the perfect size. I just posted a picture of it. 
Yeah, yeah there you go. The the gaze the, upon uh, the majesty. The, uh, as well. Of the Bingle Flex. Great to have a... Um, Binkle so is the uh, name that we call our son. So it's... Oh, he's Binkle. Uh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> anyway. So let's see. So we've got Vega, who's who's been raising their hand up for quite some time. So I'll just uh, invite them to the uh, to the audience, to the uh, to the stage. Sorry. Big fan of your work in Street Fighter Two. Thank you. I'm uh, glad you like what I've done in Street Fighter. It's a uh, <laughs> train. Uh, so when I ask my question, I uh, got to do it in a very special way because I uh, bothered to set it up. So. Uh, uh, that is, do you prefer to synthesize your drums by hand, or do you prefer to use synthesized to drum or use dedicated drum modules? <laughs> That's the best phrase question I've ever heard in my life. Through a talk box, no less. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you need like a 707 under that, I feel like. It's very sort of Daft Punk. Uh, wait, the question was, do I, do I like synthesizing the drums myself or like using existingly synthesized drums? Yeah. I like... Especially in Eurorack because, you know, it's, setting up a full drum synth takes a lot of time. Yeah, and money. Um, no, I'm like... I'm definitely an advocate for anyone who's like those people who say like, aren't you bored of like, I'm so bored of the 808. I'm so bored of the 909. I'm like, I'm really not bored of them. I, I honestly think I will be in my grave unbored of the 808, the 909, because it's just like at this point they are, they're like, it's like saying you're bored of guitars or something, you know, which some may say that, but it's, you know, it's just, they're just instruments at this point. They're like, they transcend like the idea. There's, I'm trying to the best way of putting this, but there's just something, not timeless is the wrong word because obviously they're of a particular time, but there's like, they're so ludicrously functional. They don't need to be changed in a sense. So they, they have a function. But what I would say is that they, things like the 808 and the 909 would absolutely be like the first thing I reach for, but I would like to, and I do like to augment them with other like weird drums that we haven't heard before, you know, like like so using like the Basimala Ceteritas or like the Akemi's Tycho and something on top of 808 and 909s. Um, I think it's, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not, uh, with that said though, I do love the idea of like synthesizing drums and, and having the patience like talking to Split Radix about, you know, layering up your you know, your sampler with loads of drums that you've made yourself is obviously a great thing to do and doesn't take that long. Like if you've got a reasonably decent patch, like I've, I did the, um, I had a, uh, boom shack, like the audio damage boom shack. And I was like, it's time to, I got rid of it, rid of it, but I traded it in part to get the VCS three style case that I have from too many synths. And so I just exported loads of sounds. I just did like a whole session and, you know, it's so quick. You know, once you've kind of got something set up, it really doesn't take that long and just blast out like a hundred different samples. Um, and so it's it's totally worth doing. Uh, it's just, th at the end of the day, I I just love those traditional classic sounds. I think they still sound amazing um, and I'm not bored of them and I will happily dance them all night long. So that's why I like the... The Roland TR8, I think, is one of the best drum machines that you can buy because it's like, it's so like ludicrously playable in a way that actually that the actual certainly the, like the 808. I mean, if you're Jeff Mills, then 909, of course, as well. You don't that's fine, but it's just the the TR8 with sliders with big buttons, clackety buttons. It's really usable, and it's got like the 808, the 909, the 707, and the 606 and the 727 um, and i think it has hasn't it um and so it's just it's supreme like it's it's all of those basic classic sounds 
that sounds so well together and in com- you know or individually and in combination and if you just burn it a little bit through an analog heat or stick it through your mackie with the gain turned up it just sounds great and you can just get on with the process of writing music because it's i feel like there's enough sort of decisions that we have to make in electronic music if you're you're tasked with inventing the sound of a you know bass every time when a lead every time and it's like well at least the drums you know i don't know it's it's like another thing to have to think about when these other sounds you know they sound they sound great i have no issue with them i don't feel compelled to reinvent them so then i guess do you prefer or do you think there's a difference in a musical use between a drum like the bia or even by hand synthesized drums versus sampled drums like would you rather have to cycle through 20 samples and have each variation or just cv whatever you need to yeah it just depends what you've got patience for i suppose like like yeah i mean if you've got like an actual drum synth module and you've gone to the trouble of modulating it so that it's a little bit different each time in a way that's satisfying it's like great more power to you i suppose it's just that question of what um I've been watching videos from Dan Worrell, uh, who does videos about fab filter stuff. Um, and there's a thing that he talks about, which is really interesting, where he says, because a lot of people are like, is fab filter the best? But, but are they? But are they the best? Are they the best EQs? Do they sound the best? And he's like, well, at the end of the day, it's like whether or not they sound good isn't as important as whether they're fast to use because actually speed is a huge advantage when it comes to mixing. He says the mixes that you do quicker will generally be the better ones because you are you don't have listener fatigue and, and other factors that, you know, he can he can vouch for. He's certainly more experienced and better mix engineer than I am. But I see his point. It's like by able being able to do a mix more quickly, it's better. And it will probably make more of a difference than, you know, if you use some, you know, AMEC EQ or whatever that's, you know, from the 1970s. It's harder to use, but like cooler in inverted commas. And it's like at the end of the day, the thing that will let you work faster is probably going to lead to better results and nullify any potential sound difference. And I think the same is true of any aspect of music production. It's like if you've just got, if, you, if you're busy writing a tune and you've got a TR-8, you will very quickly have a really slamming drum back line playing along with your other idea. And and that that momentum is probably going to make more of a difference than if you'd invented the, every sound from scratch because you'll, you've lost all your momentum. So it's sort of that idea. But, but also, as we've been saying before, um, is that idea that if you're, if you're smart enough to be able to separate writing from the sound design, then maybe it doesn't matter. Like you can have both. You can write fast and then you can do the sound design later. Um, but it depends on what gear you're using. Because obviously if it's hardware stuff, you've got to do it in a certain order. You kind of have to do the sound design first and then write with it. But just it's all down to you and what you have patience for. Um, whatever you choose is the right thing to do as long as it leads to good music some sage advice right there thanks <laughs> i think that what you mentioned there is about the the mixes and then all of the things that need to be well with the audience in mind and i think that we can learn a bit from 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 djs there as well where they take mixing to an art form where they make sure that they've got the snappiest more most <laughs> in time mixes uh apparent and i think that we as as music makers might might take a lesson from that as well. Um, but thanks for that question, Vega. Do appreciate it. Then we've got Dries, who's raised his hand. Let me just get him on stage as well. Hello, good evening. Hi, Hi Dries. All right, yeah. Um, uh, I'm very new to like Eurorack for, or 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 in a practical sense. I've been a fan for like two years, but I bought my first module like a year ago. Um, and I'm very happy with your with the video you did a while back on like starting out. Because uh, I, I think it was the first one that was a bit more vague from here is a basis. Here are some basic concepts, some basic ideas from building your rack. The problem I've been running into is like there is so much stuff for like if you look for a sequencer, there is seven hundred choices 
or more. Um, and, I, and I wonder if you have any advice for like people who are drowning in the choices they have. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, state of the bleeding, of course it's hard. But like, as in, yeah, like if you don't know what you want, like how, you know, I suppose it's just, yeah, it's difficult. I, like, it's just a question of how, there are lots to it. Like, do you, on one level, you could just say, why don't you just get the simplest possible sequence so that you possibly could, like, get something that's like, works like a Moog 960, where it's just 16 knobs in a row, you know, like the Dirt for Dark Time. It's that sort of idea. Um, or like the Dirt for A155, you know, the, like, go with something that's really simple and probably if i had any advice it's if you're not sure and especially if you're new to it is definitely err on the simpler side and not like because it will be easier because it, it will be easier i suppose that is one aspect but more just like i think it, there's so much to, there's still so much to be explored with even just simple sequences you can use them to both modulate the sound of things as well as the pitch of things you know and there's enough to keep you busy. There was enough to keep Tangerine Dream busy, you know, with with very similar things in the 70s where, like, and you'll have a really good time because it will be really obvious what's happening. There won't be much to get your head round. And so I suppose I can always universally recommend, like, a simpler approach. And it's just, like, even to the point of it being almost, like, childlike, but that's fine. Like the whole thing, I laugh when people say like the Buchla music keys looks like a toy. I'm like, you say that like it's a bad thing. Like I literally would see that as an enormous plus. Like something that looks fun and inviting and playful is like, that is literally what I want. want. There's nothing more I could ask. I don't want things that look brutal and strange and esoteric and odd and, I mean, yeah, I suppose there are things like math, but like, um, but yeah, so the answer to your question is like, it, if you have to choose between anything, I would say pick the simpler one. And in that sense, because also the other aspect of that is, you know, and I think I mentioned that in that 10 questions for modular synth beginners is, is this idea that the smart, the smartest thing that you can do, the most grown up thing that you can do is not buying complex modules that just do everything in one but is actually buying really really dumb components and then getting enough of them so you can build complex behavior out of them like that's actually the, the you know the galaxy brain way of using modular that's actually the point yeah, of modular sense. and it, it is actually the more advanced thing to do um so you know, in a twisted way, the most advanced thing is also a most applicable thing for, for when you're just starting out. It's just get, basically, just buy lots of dirt for modules. Like, if you just bought a whole system full of dirt for stuff, everyone would be like, like, yawn, look at your system. But you'd probably, you know, you look at Stevio. He's the perfect example. It's like, he's got really basic dirt for modules, and yet he can make the grooviest things out of them. And that's because he's he didn't just buy complex things on purpose. So, yeah, buy simple things, really dumb, simple things, and then just buy a big enough case that can accommodate lots of them. And you can then, you know, be as simple as you want to be with it. And as you grow in your knowledge, then it won't be about just buying more complex modules. It'll be about finding more complex ways to use the ones that you already own. Like, that's actually the better way of doing it and you'll be you'll learn far more in the process yeah thank you that's what i've been having the issue with from looking the most bang for my buck and then you get things with like three menu levels deep and yeah it's so it's something that looks cool but it's fun how do i start with that yeah exactly yeah no i would i would say avoid it just go yeah. go simple and just and and it'll probably be cheaper you can end up with two yeah. sequences which is way more fun than having just one so you know definitely that's the way to go i think yeah. it could be thank you yeah you're welcome thank you perfect well thanks Reese. so that's actually the um the last hand raised on this marathon <laughs> Q&A session that we've had here. So 
I'll then take the honor and asking you the last question, Alex, if you're up for it. I'm ready. What kind of question would you like to ask me? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. What, um, what would you do differently if you could do it all again? That's a great question. I can answer in def several different ways, but let's make it relevant to synthesizers and make making music in general. So one of the things that I've always felt like, okay, well, this is something, if I can do it all again, I would do it differently this time around, is I've never learned an instrument when I was younger. So I've been... My, my, my parents always, well, they, 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 there was always music playing. There was always um, uh, music there. It was always uh, Rolling Stones. It was always the animals. There was a lot of music in our house. But the one thing uh, that we didn't do, we didn't push any anyone to try to make music. So when I was, well, probably like 16 or something, I went and um, I, I helped out a, a, a local metal band and they then said, well, you've got a great voice. Well, why don't you sing for us? And that, after the child's choir, was my actual first introduction to music making. And one of the things I've always dreaded is, well, I, I needed to make music uh, before this. Then it would have been better. And then I, well, I, I got into synthesizers like eight months ago and this whole new world opened up for me and I was just, well, couldn't I have had this earlier on. And that's probably like the, the only thing I would uh, tell myself if I can do everything again, again. Well, well, at least you made a start, I suppose. That's the point. You've got to start yeah, somewhere. Well, of course, and I'm still young. I'm still 37, so yeah, I'm not that. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm still young as can be. You are a spring <laughs> chicken compared oh, yeah, to absolutely. compared to me. I'm 38. <laughs> You're only as old as you think you are. So I'm yeah. still 17 in my mind. Oh yeah, I'm still. Uh, of course, yeah, exactly. I'm still doing the same things I was doing when I was 17, just pootling around yeah. with synthesizers. So nothing changes. <laughs> Well, my, 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 my life motto has become, well, I've never done it before, so I think I can do it, which is, of course, a Pippi Longstocking approach. And <laughs> that, to start this 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 uh, string of interviews, I've used that same approach when I said, well, I've never done a YouTube channel before, but I think I can do it. And uh, look at what it brought us today. Oh, man. So, Mr. Title of Melodies, Alex... I do have to thank you for your time here today. And um, any any closing remarks, any any thoughts, any any great pieces of wisdom you want to share with us? Uh, me, 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 me. Keep just, I don't know, keep having fun. It's supposed to be fun. Always remind yourself it's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be work. So, yeah, try and have fun. God damn it. Absolutely. Hear, hear. So that, that that brings us to probably like the longest run of the Modular Clubhouse uh, in its known history. So wow. I, I, I'd like to thank Alex again, Mr. Milan Melodies, um, a round of applause virtually. And for those of you who have just joined or are listening to this recording, uh, this has been, well, a show, uh, part of Club Eurorack, maintained by the, well, I do see some people joining right now, uh, next time probably uh, <laughs> uh it's been connected to the modular clubhouse on youtube so please have a look at uh, youtube.com slash the modular clubhouse uh please have a look there and if you appreciate it like and subscribe if not hopefully you'll uh find your time well spent and for now i would say everyone please stay safe stay healthy and i hope to see you for your for our next show next week Thanks, Thanks for so having much. me. Bye. My pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, bye. <laughs>